20,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth exists a network of about 24 satellites. They orbit the Earth at 14,000 kilometers per hour. Each satellite has an atomic clock, which is updated twice per day by even more accurate atomic clocks on the Earth. This means despite the inherent drift of the atomic clock, its timing accuracy is guaranteed to be within a few nanoseconds or billionths of a second. Light will travel just 30 centimeters in one billionth of a second. On Earth, there are millions of GPS receivers. These receivers are purely passive devices. They listen to the signals from each of the satellites they can see. These signals are being continuously transmitted from each satellite. The signal is actually a phase modulated sequence of ones and zeros, known as the course acquisition or CA code. This is unique to each satellite. The CA code start time is aligned to the onboard atomic clock. The time of the start of the sequence donated S and the satellite's precise location, X, Y, and Z, are encoded as information in the same message. At any given moment, millions or billions of GPS receivers are listening for these sequences. Just like this one, it's the ZF9T MuBlox GPS timing receiver. It is capable of position accuracy up to about three meters. And it's also got a special output from which a pulse, a rising edge, signifies the time to within five nanoseconds or five billionths of a second. Light will travel just 1.5 meters in that time. The incredible accuracy of GPS is based on a simple principle. Each GPS receiver knows the code that each satellite is transmitting, and it uses this knowledge to lock its own local copy to the incoming signals. It has the capacity to do this for every GPS satellite in the sky. This process of comparing its own local copies to the incoming course acquisition codes is incredibly accurate, and it can use this to determine the time of flight of the signal from each satellite. Now, if the time of flight measurement was accurate, three measurements would be necessary to determine the location of the receiver through a process of trilateration. But there's a very important problem that we need to deal with. The receiver clock, which is likely to be an inexpensive quartz crystal, will not be synchronized to the super accurate satellite clocks. This is important because the accuracy of the time of flight measurements requires that both the time of transmission and the time of arrival share a common clock source. To understand why this must be true, imagine the Olympic 100 meter final, but the start time and the finish time were taken from different stopwatches with a known offset. This clock bias is very difficult to get around because the GPS receiver clock will drift much faster than the super accurate atomic clocks used by the satellite. And so the best we can say is that the actual time of flight measurements taken by the receiver is a biased version of the true time of flight. This is often called pseudo range. Using pseudo range will not give an accurate position from a trilateration from three satellites. Just like in the 100 meter sprint where a bias between the stopwatches will make us think the race time was shorter or faster than it actually was, the clock bias here will make the receiver think the time of flight is longer or shorter than it actually is. The difference depends on the actual clock bias times the speed of light. But if we assume the clocks in the satellite are synchronized, which they are because they're updated twice per day from the Earth, the receiver clock bias is actually a single number, a single unknown, which can be solved. And for this reason, four shooter range measurements are required. This will give us information from four separate satellites to solve for four unknowns, the X, Y, and Z coordinates of the receiver and the clock bias. And remember, the clock bias is the difference in time between the super accurate atomic clocks and the less accurate receivers. This allows the receiver to continuously correct its own clock and therefore provides a precise time estimate in addition to the location. 
human civilization has sought ever more elaborate and accurate methods to measure the passage of time. From the water clocks of the ancient Egyptians to the mechanical precision of harmonic oscillation, the pendulum clock, and eventually electric clocks based on counting the vibrating oscillations of a quartz crystal. And finally, the resonance of the atom, so-called atomic clocks, which gave accuracy so good that a second would be lost only in the time span of the entire Roman Empire. But when the rockets took off to send these atomic clocks into space, what came next would be so revolutionary, our ancestors would barely believe it was possible. What GPS gave us was more than just location. It was also more than just time. To understand why GPS was so significant, we need to understand some fundamentals about timekeeping. There are two important properties of a clock. Let's start with a perfect clock. It oscillates at a regular interval, which never changes. A real clock might oscillate close to this desired frequency, but there will always be a difference in frequency between desired and actual. This is called accuracy. Second, stability. The frequency itself will vary. There will be deviations. Now, if these deviations average out over time, you can still measure the passage of time to extremely high accuracies. A clock is nothing more than a series of equally spaced events. But of course, no practical clock can give an oscillation which is perfectly the same each time. There will always be variations. But if the variations are random, sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller, they can kind of average out over time. In the 1960s, David W. Allen devised the industry standard method of measuring clock stability. Let's say we measure the time of each clock oscillation. Due to instability, it will vary. Now take the square of the difference between each measurement. Then take its mean and divide by two. This is the Allen variance. We can conduct this measurement over different observation or averaging times to get an idea of how stable a clock is over time. In other words, do those random variations average out or does the problem keep getting worse? The higher the Allen deviation, the worse the stability and vice versa. Let's look at the Allen deviation of a typical quartz crystal. This is exactly what you get on a GPS receiver. At short time scales, a few seconds to a few minutes, the Allen deviation decreases as noise is averaged out. But over longer time periods, the stability actually gets worse. This is due to longer term effects like temperature drifts, aging, and non-white sources of noise. And so we turn to atomic clocks, a rubidium clock, to try to improve the situation. This is the type of clock on the GPS satellite. Performance is better, but it too reaches a point at which the stability starts to get worse, around half a day. This is why atomic clocks also need adjusting. They might be better than standard clocks, but eventually they will begin to drift too. Now look at the Allen deviation of a typical GPS receiver. It starts off higher, but it drops. Over long periods, GPS is incredibly stable. This is a big deal because Without GPS, without its long-term stability, your crystal oscillator and even your atomic clock will drift. It will both report the wrong time and it will be unsynchronized to other clocks. This is a GPS disciplined oscillator, GPS DO. It combines the short-term stability of a quartz crystal with the long-term stability of a GPS receiver. It can provide a disciplined 10 megahertz clock source or a super precise one pulse per second with a rising edge guaranteed to be within a few tens of nanoseconds of any other GPS timing receiver anywhere else on the planet. Such technology has become ingrained in much of our modern infrastructure. For example, power systems rely on GPS timing for fault or lightning strike detection, to analyze synchrophases, and to operate protection systems. Other critical infrastructure like telecommunication, emergency services, and transport are also heavily reliant on GPS. 
But this raises an important question. What would happen if GPS or other GNSS technologies disappeared? A recent UK government report highlighted the acute vulnerability of GNSS technologies to malicious attacks and called for more resilience and alternative technologies to guard against its failure. But why is GPS so vulnerable? Remember we talked about those course acquisition or CA codes, these atomic clock aligned beacons of time. We know that the receiver knows the code from each satellite, but the problem is, so does everyone else. And this opens up the possibility of so-called spoofing, where you generate a fake course acquisition signal or jamming, where you simply overwhelm the receiver with a much stronger signal. This stuff is not difficult. In fact, you can buy GPS spoofers for as little as a few hundred dollars. One can only imagine the technology available to advanced militaries.